Dominic Steele. Thanks for joining us. UBU, it is the catch cry of a generation, but Brian Rosner says it's the definition of sin. How to find yourself, identity. Uh, many people today are saying there's only one place to look to find yourself, and that is inward. That personal identity is a do-it-yourself project. The strategy of identity formation is often called expressive individualism. The view that you are who you feel yourself to be on the inside and that acting in accordance with this identity is living authentically. Brian Rosner is the principal of Melbourne's Ridley Theological College. He has a new book out, How to Find Yourself, Why Looking Inward is Not the Answer. And uh, I read it on holidays a month ago. I've scribbled all over it. I found it super helpful uh, in terms of better understanding the generation that I'm attempting to communicate to and actually better at understanding myself as well and some of the ideas that I have unconsciously imbibed. I think it's a book that's going to have a significant impact. Brian, thanks so much for, for writing this book, but for, for coming in. Thanks, Dominic. Um, you be you and this uh, definition of a generation. Um, tell us about it, expressive individualism. Well, um, um, Carl Truman wrote the book explaining where it came from, yep. as you may know, so yep. the, uh, uh, the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And my book's really not so much looking at the roots, but the fruit of that movement and uh, an alternative way of doing yourself, if you like. Yeah, but let's the, just, can we just dig into that? Because, yep. I mean, you were telling me that it's not that Truman wrote his book and then you've written it, this on top of it as a conclusion or application, but you were writing parallel, and but they've got different purposes. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So Carl is uh, a church historian and historian mm -hmm. um, in the main. So his book's really about the intellectual roots, the history of ideas. And he's saying, well, how come we've got to this point where expressive individualism is, has kind of won the day in a mm -hmm. sense? It's only the last 30, 40 years mm -hmm. that that's happened. So people are talking about uh, nowadays the catch cries are be true to yourself. Um, uh, you do you, as you mm -hmm. said, is, is kind of the hippest latest mm -hmm. version. And it's this idea that you reject all external authority. Your personal happiness is, is the ultimate goal in life. And uh, by following your own heart and, and your dreams, mm -hmm. you, you'll, you'll achieve that happiness and you'll become your true self. Mm -hmm. So Truman's done how we got here and you've done, well, what do we do about it? Now we are here. <laughs> yeah, my, mine's a much more popular level book, just to be fair to Carl. I mean, <laughs> Carl's a big brain. Um, but, but, but I've tried to read widely. So I've looked at sociology and anthropology and cultural studies, all that kind of thing. And I hang out with people of... Um, younger people at college, of course. Mm -hmm. I've got kids different ages. So uh, in, in part, I guess, the book's written for me mm. because I, I want to understand them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've found that expressive individualism and, and the identity issues in our day, I find them quite confusing mm -hmm. and confronting. It, it certainly reminds me of, of the cultural aspect of who we are. So culture's that invisible force that, that moulds you and affects you. And it's really subconscious most of the time. So your attitude to authority, to parenting, to holidays, to uh, how you gesture, how close you sit to, towards someone, all of those things are below the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think identity formation is certainly below the surface. Mm -hmm. So what I try and do is expose the movement, mm -hmm. um, explain it, and then uh, really um, put it to the test. See, is, is it really achieving the good life for people? What, mm -hmm. are, what are the outcomes for individuals and society? And then look at what does the Bible say about identity and, and how does it differ and, and what, what, what can we learn from the Bible about how to become ourselves, if you like. What I found super helpful was um, when I graduated from Theological College, I'd, um, I realised, this is 20 years ago, I realised I'd become really well equipped to reach a modernist generation and yet under my feet we'd become a postmodern generation. And there's a whole lot of thinking we n I now needed to do, how do I communicate the gospel to postmoderns? And it kind of feels like 20 years later, you and Truman coming from your different perspectives, or slightly different perspectives or slightly different application, mm, yep. have shown me how to reach the next generation 20 years on. Yeah. Yeah, well, I hope it's helpful and useful for people on that score. And what I love is the fact that, um, well, my, my own journey was this, with this topic started yep. in, in the mid-90s when I had a, an identity crisis of my own. Well, so, tell us about that, because you were quite 
vulnerable in the book about that. Yeah, I had to be pushed to do it, but a book about personal identity should be personal. <laughs> um, so I, basically my wife left me in the mid 90s. I was with my own on the kids for five years, really difficult time. The, the and you were a secular academic at the time. Yeah, yeah, well, I was at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, in the Divinity Faculty. You're right. Yeah, but um, so a lot of the things that made me me, if you like, were kind of stripped away, and I, I had a crisis of identity to the extent I wondered, who am I really? Mm -hmm. And what I found was that uh, my old friends were the most help in helping me to find myself, mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the Bible, being a Christian, and I found knowing God was a great challenge in life, it kind of drives you on, but being known by God personally, intimately as his child is, is such a comfort when, when you feel destabilized. And it, it really um, steadied my course. And, uh, um, and, and since then I've really looked at the Bible's teaching on, on identity, among other things, in yeah. the last 20, 25 years. And it's amazing how much of the Bible addresses these issues so helpfully and with such truth. Knowing God versus being known by God. Okay. Well, being known by God, it, it's not as common in the Bible, but it does appear at key points. So you've got Israel, David, Jeremiah, and the church are all known by God. Sometimes the verses are obscured because the translations go a different way. So. Um, for example, uh, Abraham is known by God, and it's, and it's usually translated chosen by God. But there's some famous verses I'm sure you'll know. Mm -hmm. So Galatians 4, 8 and 9, at one time you didn't know God, now you do know God, or rather you're known by God. Jesus says at the last mm -hmm. judgment speeches in the synoptics, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, uh, then we will know fully as we known. have been fully known. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's not about being known about, it's being known personally, intimately. And it's just like with our children, initially at least we give them their identity by naming them, by exposing them to uh, experiences, by passing on our values. The same thing happens with God. He gives us our identity. We become part of his family, and that ends up making a huge difference. Mm. So expressive individualism, um, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, as you explained, it's the idea that you look inward to find yourself and behaving according to that identity is um, uh, acting and living authentically. Now. The movement has at least three benefits. So it's usually set against the kind of 1950s, supposedly stultifying and conformist days. Mm -hmm. So the three benefits I see are one, obviously self-reflection is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Paul says, think about yourself soberly with sober judgment. Uh, the second benefit is that living authentically is clearly a good thing. The psychologists say that in accordance with who you really are, acting mm -hmm. consistently with that. But the third benefit is that uh, some marginalized groups in society who don't have the typical identity markers of the mainstream have found that this benefit, this, this movement's benefited them to the extent that they've, they've, they've received more dignity and acceptance in society. Now, having said that, notwithstanding those benefits, I think it's, it's been disastrous in all sorts of ways. So three Fs I talk about in the book. One, it leads to a fragile sense of self. Mm. The great irony is it's never been more important to know who you are, but it's also never been more difficult. Yeah. So Taylor Swift recently said when she received her honorary doctorate, that's I not do, making I that do, up. I do find that <laughs> yes. extraordinary. Yeah, when she got her honorary <laughs> doctorate, she said, I've got good news for you. Um, you've got to find yourself, and the good news is it's totally up to you. Then she said, it, the terrifying news is it's totally up to you. So people recognise that just looking inward really doesn't lead to a stable and satisfying sense of self. And then I think it's also failing to lead to the good life, as I mentioned earlier. There's more anxiety, there's more narcissism, there's more anger in society. And people point to different things to explain that. So not enough mindfulness, technology addling our brains, mm -hmm. social cohesion being lost, loss of community. But I think they're more symptoms than their actual mm -hmm. cause. I think the just looking inward to find yourself leads to many of these problems. And then finally, the third F is that it's, it's faulty in that sociologists, anthropologists generally admit 
that we don't know ourselves mm -hmm. by looking just looking inward. We know ourselves by being known by others. Mm. So there's a kind of looking glass self, it was called, where if you're married, if you've got close friends, you'll know this. You, you find out about yourself through your relationships. Mm. That's where God, knowing us as his children, I think, comes in. But the third one is we look around to find ourselves that, that, sorry, we look around to our relationships. We also look backwards and forwards to our story. So we have a narrative identity, to mm -hmm. use Tim Keller's words. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as we like to think we're the star of our own show, we really are formed by shared stories, either of our nations, our ethnicities, or in this case, by faith. And the big stories in society at the moment seem to be secular materialism, mm -hmm. which has a naive view of human nature, thinks that education and technology will perfect humanity. Yeah. It, it, it's a tragic story because it's really gods that fail Do that you... people are committed to. And then just quickly, yeah. the other one is the social justice movement, which is a story about there being really three groups in society, the oppressed, their loyal allies, sometimes called the woke, and the oppressors. And if we can only deal with the oppressors and stop them, even eliminate them, cancel them, then we'll lead to a kind of uh, uh, nirvana in society. The sad reality is that it seems to be leading to more division and discord in society. And it's a story, it, it ends up being a farce of a story. As much as social justice issues need to be addressed, making them so central mm. uh, distorts what's actually the reality, namely that we're all capable of evil. The, mm. the original, if you like, uh, diverse and inclusive industry on earth is human evil. Every one of us <laughs> is is culpable in that sense. So the idea that, that evil's restricted to one group is, is really unhelpful. Mm. Um, let's just do secular, um, uh, secular materialism and then we'll come back to social justice. Yep. Um, that, that sense you said that um, Education is the answer. Yep. I feel, and I'm, I'm just wanting to test my thought here on you, um, I feel that I'm not hearing that quite as much as I did five, ten years ago. It, it felt that it was more prevalent then than, than right now. Is that your sense as well? I, I think the, the secular materialist story basically will always um, go up and down depending on uh, the rejection of religion. Mm -hmm. So the other way to, the other place you need to look, and I didn't say this, to find yourself is upwards. Yeah. And the secular materialist says we don't need to look up to mm -hmm. God, but in the end we we tend to absolutize certain things like education, mm -hmm. like uh, excuse me, like money or like sex, like our own pleasure, like our own families, and um, making those contingent things absolute is really a substitute for God. And we end up, as I said earlier, with gods that fail. Certainly with the economic problems of the last couple of years and the ones we're facing at the moment, it does give people pause to think that that naive view of the world improving with education technology might not be the case, but it, 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 it still comes back. Mm. Um, you run five tests through this book on different worldviews, um, an existential test on um, suffering and disappointment, an egotism test on pride and envy, an ethics test on how we treat weak and lowly people, enemy test, how we deal with our enemies, and the enjoyment test, how we deal with happiness and pleasure. And you look at different kind of philosophies of life and kind of Take me through secular materialism on those tests. Yeah, Yeah. well, secular materialism, the story is that um, we're coming out of the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. So rather than calling them the Middle Ages, they're called the Dark Ages. And the Enlightenment is what's really going to the 18th century and on, mm -hmm. onwards. Those thinkers, the triumph of reason, will eventually lead to um, a place where uh, human beings can flourish, mm -hmm. every, 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 every single one of us. So... Life stories are really made up of these defining events in mm -hmm. the past. So some of the defining events might be um, uh, the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Um, uh, there are different versions of secular materialism too. So you've got the sexual revolution mm -hmm. and then consumerism. So in both those cases, they're like subgenres of the big story. Um, the sexual revolution was really driven by uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. making sex so, uh, so central to our identities. Mm -hmm. um, also by the, the pill, 
because mm. the pill made the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s possible. Mm. It broke the nexus between sex and, uh, sex and having babies, yeah. basically. Yeah, and, um, and then you've got a struggle in the present. It's, if only we could just get everyone to be educated and uh, society would improve dramatically. And it, the, the, the Enlightenment thinkers really had a pretty grand vision mm. of, of progress which has been interrupted, as you say, um, uh, the, with world wars, with, with the terrible things that have happened. So the idea that you can simply improve humanity through, um, through educating us all has been proven to be wrong again and again. And as much as we naively and optimistically look to the end of wars in our world, I remember at the end when the Iron Curtain came down across Europe in the 90s, the, uh, people predicted we'll never see another war. Mm. And most of the 21st century's, well, n not entirely, but for the Western countries, been pretty clear. But now mm. we've got this terrible war in the Ukraine. Mm. So at the, the problem with secular materialism is it is it underestimates the prevalence and universality of human evil. Mm. Let's turn to social justice as another narrative. Mm. And you had again these five tests that yep. you analysed the problem. It's not giving us what we wanted. Well, it doesn't seem to be, does it? it the, social justice, again, the narrative is based around these defining events in the past, whether good or bad. So uh, women receiving the vote, um, uh, progress in the fight against racism, uh, the different sexualities are sometimes seen as part of that story as well. And um, the world is then seen through the eyes of, of, of kind of victimhood mm -hmm. and oppression. And there's no doubt that there was persecution and discrimination and prejudice, mm -hmm. and there still is to some extent. But the truth is we've made enormous progress through mm. the 20th century. But just when we've made that progress, there seems to be an upsurge in a desire to put every right in the past wrong, get rid of the statues, all that kind of thing, and also to address them in the present. What I find really interesting is people like Stan Grant, indigenous mm. um, media guy who's, uh, who's absolutely brilliant, got a little book on identity. He points out how unworkable the movement is to some extent. So he says when he, when he filled out the census, he could only tick one box. But his uh, white grandmother had such an impact on him, he felt like he was being uh, disloyal to her by just ticking the indigenous mm. box. So the reality is none of us are really one or two of these attributes. And he also talks about the need to move beyond the victim status. Now, with both these big stories, when I do the five tests, I, I, I'm not just making it up. People are saying that we have an existential crisis. People are uh, more anxious than ever, that uh, there's an outrage culture going on, um, that... Um, there's a lack of compassion and kindness in society. And then finally, the really ironic one, of course, is that the movement hasn't led to the rise in happiness that people were hoping for. Mm -hmm. People, uh, there's, there's kind of a happiness index, um, which is tested every year around the world. And people in the West have become less and less happy, even though in material terms, we're better off than we've ever been. Mm. Now, I read this a month ago and uh, Two weeks ago, I preached my first evangelistic sermon since reading this, and um, uh, I was on Romans 5, it was a baptism weekend, we had a whole stack of people being baptised, and, um, uh, and so I wanted to define how we had peace with God, and we didn't have peace with God, and we, the, the problem we have of sin, and because I'd read this, I found myself deep in your, your thinking, and it was super helpful. Um, I mean, these lines, these major tenets of the best way to find yourself is to look in with the highest goal in life is happiness. All moral judgments are merely expressions of feeling or personal preference, forms of external authority to be rejected. Um, the world will improve dramatically as the scope of individual freedom grows. Everyone's quest for self-expression should be celebrated. Um, you really are defining Genesis 3 there, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is odd, isn't it? That, uh um, personal autonomy, as you used to say in, in your evangelistic yeah. course, yeah. does seem to be at the heart of, on the one hand, human sin, and also expressive individualism. Expressive individualism. So yeah. there's, a, there's a deep irony there. Yeah. yeah. And so I found myself, I mean, quoting you, saying those words, and feeling a connection with the, in the room that, oh, uh, yeah. that 
I thought was, um, well, excellent, really. Yeah. That, that's really helpful. That's encouraging to hear. Yeah, I think the book has and you potential evangelistic. In the same way last week. Did you did you run that same idea? <laughs> well, I was actually in a different context. Uh -huh. I was in um, um, an Arabic speaking context. It's a church in Melbourne, uh, which is um, the the vicar's. Uh, um, guy from Egypt and mm -hmm. he's got people from Iran and uh, all sorts of other countries in the so Middle East. Not so Western it didn't quite fit yeah. there to the same extent, but they were, um, there, there was the temptation to adopt the prosperity gospel. So consumerism mm -hmm. baptised into Christianity is, is something that was evident in their context. And I think Romans 5, 1 to 11 does deal with that in terms of um, rather than health and wealth, mm -hmm. hope and hardship are the main benefits of mm -hmm. the gospel there. So give me a little riff on Genesis 3. Do you know if you were communicating to the 20-somethings now who are deep in this worldview? Well, I think the identity lens is actually a really good one for reading Scripture. So Scripture's like that, isn't it? You, you don't notice all the teaching about suffering until you're suffering. Mm -hmm. I think we're at that moment now. You don't notice all the teaching about identity in the Bible until you put on that lens and start reading it in that light. So in Genesis 3, it's really about um, the identity of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. um, Calvin said that uh, um, they were really wondering, are they true sons and daughters of God? Mm -hmm. So when you read that beside, especially the temptation narrative in the Synoptic Gospels, mm -hmm. you'll see that Jesus is, his, his temptations are also about his identity. If you're truly the son of God, is what uh, Satan says to, to Jesus. So what we find in Genesis 3 is Adam and Eve rejecting God as their father, finding their own identity outside of that relationship with him, and eventually, of course, it leads to death. And when you read it alongside Jesus, taking God's word and the Father's word as true and following it and finding it to be the way to find yourself is is what you can see when you read the passages side by side. Mm. Um, Satan is engaged in the great identity deception was one of your lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it works, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more, of course, in the Bible on identity. A couple of passages are, to give you an example. So the idea of our lives as stories, there's a sense in which the Christian lives the life story of Jesus Christ. So Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, you, you could translate it this way. You could say, you died and your identity is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ appears, you too will appear with him in glory because he's your life story. And we see that with baptism. We see it with the Lord's Supper. It's, it's the way in which Christians find their identity as a group in that shared narrative. And that makes all the difference to how we live mm. because the defining moment in our lives is, is not something in our own experience necessarily. It's, it's that you died with Christ. Christ died as our representative. And when he returns, his true identity will be revealed to the world as will ours because we'll come back um, with him as uh, uh, true sons and daughters of God. And then in the meantime, that identity, uh, those are, uh, defining moments and destiny make all the difference to how we live. So in Colossians 3, Paul goes on to say, uh, don't live as those who don't know God live. Mm -hmm. And the defining feature of our conduct is love. Again, that goes back to the cross. So the cross is where I found so much help in thinking about identity issues not just who we are, how God has bought us and so on, but how we are to live in the present and the way in which we'll be uh, uh, defined in the future. I mean, if I push you now to be self-revealing, um, when you had that big crisis um, and you were kind of rebuilding you, and how did you look to the cross at that point? Well, when you don't know who you are, you're and that capable. Really was where you were, wasn't oh, it? Oh, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I mean yes. I mean, I came back to your Australia. Your identity as a, as a Bible guy, as a teacher, stripped Yeah, there, there was the potential for me to engage in all sorts of behaviours. Mm -hmm. I mean, vengeful behaviours, um, sexually immoral behaviours, and so on. Mm. And I mean, um, lots of, we do divorce care here, and lots of people tell us the story of when marriage breaks down, they go unstable and act outside their long ca character. Absolutely, paper. yes. 
Yeah, that, that, that's, that's true. And I think being known by God, being reminded that my, my identity is hidden with Christ in God, um, that I've been bought with a price, um, that I'm to live in a way consistent with that identity, ended up making a big difference. Mm. One, one of the uh, key tenets of expressive individualism is the idea that you belong to yourself. Mm. And I think one of the most countercultural statements in the Bible is in 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul says, you were bought with a price. You mm. don't belong to yourself. You are not your own. And again, there is potential here for abuse. You might think to yourself, well, belonging to someone else is kind of the definition of oppression. But the context there is love mm. because you, you, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So we've been loved with an everlasting love. And that makes such a difference to who we are and to our identities. And love songs have the same idea. The, the very definition of romantic love is a mutual belonging. Mm-hmm. Going back to the Song of Songs, I am my beloved's and he is mine. And I think um, that there is great potential for going back to the Bible and addressing our context in identity terms. So I think we, we can actually, and this is what Christians have always done, they contextualise the gospel, the same message expressed in new language that is communicative in a new context. So, for example, um, be true to yourself. We, we should be saying to believers, be true to your true self in Christ, to your new self. And that's the logic Paul and other New Testament authors use. You do you, you should do the new you. Sure, behave consistent with your identity, but the identity that each of us has you, in Christ. In yes, yeah. yes. So I think, and the other thing we've really got to do is to tell a better story. The big stories of social justice without looking up and uh, um, secular materialism, which both stories don't look up, end up being tragedies and farces. We need to tell a better story. We need to say there is a better story out there which we can live. And I think um, um, more attention to the narrative of Scripture can help and also giving examples where people are behaving according to the new identity, consistent with that defining event of self-giving love. So in the book, I have a few paragraphs here and there where ordinary Christians inspire and encourage me by their behavior. I mean, just one example, Mm. Bill, a guy at church, uh, lives in a house that he wants to knock down and rebuild on. The neighbors held him up for two years Uh, basically with all sorts of ridiculous objections. And during that time, the neighbor's son would come next door and ask Bill for help with his science homework for his university degree. Now, Bill never gave it a thought. He would just do that. So that's an example of not of of forgiving your enemies, of, of, of showing sacrificial love. And if you ask Bill, why are you doing that? I don't think he would say he's obeying a command. It's just who he is, mm. having been defined by his death with Christ, having that sense of security and love that comes from being known personally and intimately by God, and having that future assured where um, when Christ returns, he too will be um, uh, revealed as a son and, and as a child of God. So I think that the narratives of Scripture are really important and helping people to see the story you inhabit is not the story that's being told everywhere in the media and uh, um, in, in our world today. There's a better story. So I'm just thinking aloud. When I first, that transition I told you about before between modernism and postmodernism that, that I went on, and an application of that was how I preached the how I preached Christ, and so I stopped saying, if you like, the gospel for. I mean, if, if I'm thinking of the gospel outline, two ways to live, um, and I might have said to a modernist, well, there are six propositions that make up Christianity. The first proposition, God is the creator of the world. Second proposition, we rebel against God. Whereas, as a postmodern or communicating to the postmodern, I'd say, um, well, let me tell you the story of how I think God is related to me. I think he made me. I think he's not just me, but he's the creator of the world. Now, how would you, having written this book, take me through that gospel logic? You know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll be the non-Christian. Yep. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm 23. Yep. And you're saying to me. Yeah. Now, Dominic, it's a different book. 
yeah. you're asking me to talk about. Yeah. And at the end of the book, I make that appeal. I say, look, the, the, we need um, people who have a gift for evangelism. Yeah. I, I try and do the work of an evangelist, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm not an evangelist. Yeah. Um, but you've so I, helped me in my thinking. I mean, you've, you've prompted me to... Um, I, I'm just thinking about a future version of Introducing God, and um, I'm so glad I've read this book first. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear that. I think um, it's interesting, we, the modernist versus postmodernist thing, but the essence of postmodernism, as I understand it, is mm. the rejection of all metanarratives. Mm -hmm. So the big stories of capitalism, of Marxism, etc., were rejected, of Christianity mm -hmm. as well, by um, the uh, uh, postmodern thinkers, and everyone's individual story becomes really the essence of who they are and what's really important in life. So, what's what, one thing to say is that when Paul, in the Book of Acts and in some of his letters, goes around doing his evangelism, he often tells his own story. Mm -hmm. So, a personal story is not illegitimate. And I think us older guys who come from a modernist mindset need to realise that objective truth needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. We keep needing to fight that battle, but the personal story can really connect with people. So I think um, in terms of personal evangelism, I, I, I want to hear what, what people's story is. Mm -hmm. And then once having heard that story, I can tell my own story. Mm -hmm. And my own story is really to do ultimately with this bigger story, which we understand to be the gospel, the fact that Jesus died for our sins, that we died with him, it impacts us profoundly in the present and we look forward to a glorious future. And, and that story, the story of God redeeming the world, in which I play just a bit part, mm. is a much better story than me being the hero, the, the main protagonist, the director, and uh, the scriptwriter of my own little story, which which really in the end is is not going to end well. Hmm. So I think helping people to see that following your heart and uh, living your own story, it 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 it's not going to cut it in the end, and it doesn't lead to the kind of life that people actually desire. So the lovely thing about the gospel is that it does deal with the fundamental problems of humanity, our sin, judgment, all of that. But it's also the best way to live. Mm. It does actually live, lead to the good life, to human flourishing, if uh, you want to put it that way. And the church is a little glimpse of the kind of human flourishing that will be the reality of the heaven and uh, new heavens and new earth in the future. Super helpful. Thanks for sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Brian Rosner, and uh, he is the author of uh, this book, How to Find Yourself While Looking Inward is Not the Answer. And uh, look, I so recommend it to, uh, to pastors, parents, and well, Christians and non-Christians alike uh, will find this super helpful. Thanks for being with us on The Pastor's Heart this afternoon, and we'll look forward to your company next Tuesday.